Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Welcome to the College of Engineering's inaugural Distinguished Lecture Series on Engineering and Humanity. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Justin Schwartz, and I have the honor of being the Harold and Inge Marcus Dean of Engineering here at Penn State. Um, and as I look around this room, it is great to see so many of you here, so many students, staff, faculty, visitors, and not just from the College of Engineering, but from so many colleges and disciplines across our university. The breadth and size of the audience speaks to Penn State's commitment to equity. So welcome, and thank you for being here. It's truly an honor to have Dr. Claude Steele here with us today for the first in a series of lectures on engineering and humanity. Impact on humanity is at the core of the engineering discipline, yet there is really a lack of discussion of engineering in this context. Meanwhile, the divide between our technical and non-technical worlds continues to grow. We in the Penn State College of Engineering are taking it upon ourselves to take a leadership role within the engineering community to bridge that gap and make engineering humanity our story. Yet to accomplish this, we must go beyond technical excellence and integrate with the rest of society and the rest of culture to show how what we do impacts people every day. So today, Dr. Steele will talk about stereotype threat and identity threat and what we can do as faculty, staff, and students to foster a diverse learning community where all can thrive and prosper in their academic and professional careers. In the Penn State College of Engineering, we are proud to have a long history of commitment to equity. In 1893, our college reached an important milestone when Carrie McElwain was the first female to graduate with an engineering bachelor's degree. But it was another 40 years until Benson Dutton in 1933 became the first African American to receive an engineering bachelor's degree. And shortly thereafter in 1936, Dorothy Quiggle was the first female Nittany Lion to earn an engineering PhD. A commitment to inclusion is also found throughout the university's history. A great example is the story behind the origin of the We Are Penn State cheer that has become synonymous with our university. When college football teams were still largely segregated, Penn State's was not. And in 1948, when Penn State was asked to leave Wally Triplett, its lone black player behind, when traveling to Dallas to play the Cotton Bowl, his teammate Steve Suey said, no, we are, we are Penn State. So I hope we all can take pride that our famous rallying cry is really rooted in inclusion. But if you fast forward 70 years to today, sadly there remains a distinct lack of equity in engineering. At our College of Engineering, we're driven to have an inclusive and diverse student body and a culture where everyone feels safe to live and learn and achieve excellence. So soon we'll be launching a branding campaign centered on engineering humanity with emphases on diversity, inclusiveness, equity, collaboration, and social engagement. We have set a goal of gender equity in our undergraduate programs, increased diversity across all categories, and to be the national leader in diversity, equity, and climate amongst the large colleges of engineering. So with that backdrop, when considering who to invite as our inaugural distinguished speaker, we sought someone who could help us better understand issues related to student success in climate. Dr. Claude Steele immediately rose to the top of our list, and I was honored when he agreed to come to Penn State to not only speak, but to also spend time with students, university leadership, and College of Engineering leadership to talk about how we can really improve our climate. Dr. Steele is a world-renowned social psychologist and professor of psychology at Stanford University, who has dedicated years of research on stereotype threat and its application to minority student academic performance. Dr. Steele holds a BA in psychology from Hiram College, as well as an MA in social psychology, and a PhD in social psychology and statistical psychology from Ohio State University. So please put your biases aside, despite the fact that he is from Ohio State University. <laughs> Dr. Steele has served in numerous major academic leadership positions, most notably as ex Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost at the University of California, Berkeley, the James Quillen Dean for the School of Education at Stanford, and the Provost at Columbia University. He has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Science Board, the National Academy of Education, and the American Philosophical Society. He's a fellow of the American Institutes for Research and the American Academy of Political and Social Science. Dr. Steele is also the grandson of a slave. In 2010, he released his book, Whistling Vivaldi and Other Clues to How Stereotypes Affect Us, thus bringing these issues to the national forefront of discussion. So I hope many of you have had a chance to read this defining work. Uh, without further ado, it, please join me uh, in welcoming Dr. Steele, who will now discuss stereotype threat and identity threat, the science of a diverse community. Dr. Steele, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a real, real pleasure to be here. And uh, I had hoped that uh, Dean Schwartz wouldn't mention that whole Ohio State thing, but <laughs> it popped out. So well, you'll have to forgive me part of my past, I guess. Uh, I, I, can, I can say that when I was at Ohio State so long ago, we were not in the same conference. So it didn't have the same meaning then. Um, at any rate, it's a real pleasure to be here and to see um, so many faces uh, in, in the audience. I wish my mother would, could see this. <laughs> um, I would like to focus on the issue of how do we, how does one uh, have a successful, diverse uh, community? Uh, and by community, I, I mean all, all kinds of communities, everything from, say, a classroom to a whole university to a K-12 through school to a corporation, uh, containable communities that we get a chance to have some, some influence over. How do you uh, make those communities a, a place where people feel like they can thrive, they feel comfortable there, they feel like they belong there, uh, they, they feel that their identities, whatever they are, are not going to impede their access to the opportunities in that kind of situation. That's the ideal of what, uh, what we would like to uh, achieve. And uh, I guess uh, as a social scientist, as a social psychologist, I'm uh, sort of constantly wondering, can we offer some insights into how to do that, into how to uh, uh, enable our institutions to function better in this, in this way? So that is the big uh, focus. Uh, I want to answer really three basic questions, why I think that's important uh, and why I think that's increasingly important to American uh, society. Uh, the answer to that has a lot to do with the increasing diversity of this society uh, and, and the uh, notion that we may need an expanded pedagogy in general to uh, accommodate and to uh, give that kind of experience to a full range of citizens. Uh, I also want to uh, go out on the limb and argue that there is one particular thing that I think we could focus on that would help the situation. Uh, and uh, as a scientist, one is like never completely 100% confident of, 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 of uh, anything. Uh, but uh, one is a, a professional doubter and a skeptic, and you wait for data and so on and so forth. So, uh, but I, 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 you do have to propose things, and so I'm going to propose something and hope that that uh, is useful. And, and then I want to uh, uh, itemize uh, a list of things that I think uh, might be from that reasoning, uh, general wisdoms in how you go about designing such a diverse uh, community. So that's the, the ambition for, for the talk. In my own mind, it has really two sections. I'll take a little time to sort of warm us up on the concepts of uh, stereotype threat and social identity threat to give us some sense of what those uh, are. Uh, and then I will get into this issue of how to, what, what I'm going to propose is, is the critical uh, ingredient, the chicken soup <laughs> of these things that I think is, is critical and then how to, uh, how to do it. So that's the way I will uh, proceed. So, beginning with uh, stereotype threat, it, it is a, it's a very uh, uh, simple idea. It, it, it certainly was an idea that did not spring into my mind in some one big epiphany or anything of that sort. Uh, it was a long struggle to get to this concept. Uh, we started just trying to understand a phenomenon, and the phenomenon is uh, what the psychometricians call underperformance. Sometimes they call it overprediction, but it's the situation where for groups whose intellectual abilities are negatively stereotyped in the larger society, uh, for, for those groups, uh, in their subsequent level of schooling, uh, even when you match them for preparation with some level of schooling, even when you match them perfectly, those groups who endure those stereotypes don't perform quite as well. Uh, and that was a phenomenon I didn't know anything about, and I encountered it uh, in my time at the University of Michigan. And uh, it is, uh, a, just became a real focus, a puzzle for, for me. Why should this exist? I guess I thought up until that time that if you, our job as ed educators, if you got uh, women in STEM fields equally prepared, if you got African American students in general equally prepared and you admitted them to some level of schooling, that the, the subsequent performance would be the same. There wouldn't be anything called underperformance left over after the preparation for that level of schooling had been, had been achieved. It's the same. 
Uh, so it was a, a mystery, and, uh, and, and, and uh, I'll spare you the wandering in the wilderness as to how over really about a five or six year period of time, uh, uh, the, the data uh, kept giving us this profile of uh, the, what we eventually came to call stereotype threat. Uh, it's a very simple uh, very simple definition to it, very simple phenomenon. It's any time you're in a situation or you're doing something for which a negative stereotype about one of your identities is relevant. You're doing something and a stereotype about one of your identities is relevant. Uh, at, that, at some level, you know then that you could be judged or treated in terms of that stereotype. And if the thing you're doing, this is very important, if the thing you're doing is very important to you, then the prospect of being judged or reduced to a stereotype in this thing that's very important to you is upsetting and distracting and can interfere with your performance right there in the immediate situation. And it can also affect your decision-making, your willingness to go forward in a path of life where you may be persistently subject to that kind of pressure. That's the idea of stereotype threat. Everybody has stereotype threat, and I believe experiences it probably on a daily basis. Uh, some of our identities have very uh, silly stereotypes about them, and so we're, and we're at risk of being judged in terms of those. It isn't too upsetting, and it doesn't mean very much. It might even be comical. I've been using the example. I've just moved into uh, a new apartment, and my son-in-law uh, has been helping me set up my television and my stereo. And, a <laughs> and he certainly does look at me through the lens of a stereotype about aging and people who <laughs> are completely out of touch with the modern technical world and, and can hardly turn on their televisions. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I endure this because he'll help me do this. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I don't quarrel. I can talk to about him when I'm out of town. But <laughs> uh, so, you know, that's stereotype threat. I know he's seeing me through the lens of a stereotype of somebody aged and unable to, in dotage, who can't manage these things. Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's more funny. It's funny. It's not a big deal. Uh, but if you are a woman and you are in the advanced uh, coursework in uh, STEM fields and you feel comparable uh, pressure uh, that, and, and you're very invested in doing well in that kind of situation, that kind of pressure can be upsetting. And just, and, and something that is indeed a, 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 a deal to contend with. And that's the, the point. Uh, of uh, stereotype threat. It's, it's not a, a fancy uh, notion. I, uh, it's, it's a cousin to just being uh, worried about any human judgment. I, I used to use the example of, uh, of my uh, Aunt Ruby, uh, who, on, uh, who thought that my family brought dishes to the Thanksgiving dinner that were too fancy. Okay, that was her opinion of us, our branch of the family. And so uh, on, on Thanksgiving morning, when you were there preparing your dishes to bring to the Thanksgiving dinner, it's as if Aunt Ruby's, you know, sitting right over your shoulder. You, well, should we put the marshmallows on or hold back the marshmallows? What you, you know, what, how, how should we handle that? You're, you're, you're contending with that possible judgment. It's, again, it's almost a silly judgment. But you know how these judgments are felt in families. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's, it's real. Uh, the, 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 the difference between that and stereotype threat is that uh, as a member of a culture, you know everybody in your culture could be seeing you through the lens of a stereotype. It's not just your one Aunt Ruby who's got a particular opinion about you. You know everybody in the society knows the stereotype about your group. And when you're in a situation where that stereotype is relevant, uh, you know that you could be. You don't know that you are but you know that you could be judged and treated in terms of it, and you now have the task of being vigilant to that and of sorting out whether, in fact, that stereotype is, is guiding, is, is directing people's behavior toward you. You've got, you've got a problem, and it's a serious problem there. It could be a problem big enough to affect your decision about what fields you want to go into, where you want to live your uh, life. Do I want to have this problem on an ongoing basis, or could I find another place to exist? Okay, uh, some of the early experiments, I think, are, are helpful in illustrating this. Uh, one of the first ones, the first one we ever did, had to do with women in math, and this was at the University of Michigan, and we got uh, 
uh, sophomore math students who were really, really good in math and really invested in it, women and men. We made uh, sure that we, they were matched in terms of their prior grades and test scores and so forth so that their, their preparation was, was identical, the same, matched. Uh, and then we put them in a room by themselves, one at a time, and we gave them a really difficult math test. Uh, the half hour section of the graduate record exam you take if you're a math major. Uh, and we did that because we uh, wanted this test to be really difficult and frustrating. Uh, our reasoning was that that would make it a different situation for women than it would be for men. For men, they would, as they experience that frustration, uh, have worries like, well, uh, maybe I'm not as good at math as I thought I was. <laughs> Be upsetting a bit. Uh, but for women, they would have that worry too. Maybe I'm not as good at math as I thought I was, but uh, am I confirming what people say about women's math ability? Is that something I'm... Is that also on the... <laughs> and the thought of wrestling with all that right in the middle of taking a timed test, our reasoning was that women would not do as well as men on that, even though we'd carefully matched them in their preparation for it. And indeed, that's what happened. Women scored uh, 15 points lower in that situation. We think of 15 points, think of them like on an IQ scale or something, comparable to that. Standard deviation lower. Uh, now, that we had replicated then, there, what, you found, what we observed in the real world in math classes, as advanced math classes, not in entry-level math classes, but in advanced math classes at the University of Michigan, that women uh, uh, were uh, same prior test scores and grades and so on, but they weren't doing as well as the men in those advanced courses. Uh, so here we had a situation, and we'd replicated that in the laboratory, and now we could sort of take it apart and get some sense of what was going on there. That was the idea. Uh, the data, the first finding, was immediately critiqued <laughs> in our lab as, uh, well, you haven't really shown anything about this thing you call stereotype threat, because maybe the difference between men and women on that math test is due to differences. It's a hard test. Maybe that's the kind of test that brings out these these sort of um, genetic differences between men and women in math ability. Maybe you've just supported that. So um, we had to come up with a methodology, and this is sort of where the sort of standard methodology of stereotype threat research was born. Uh, we had to duplicate the experiment, but this time create a situation where the women taking the test would not experience that stereotype threat. Everything else would be the same but that threat would be removed. And we eventually came to a very simple procedure for doing that. Other people, years hence, have come up with a lot of other ones, but a very simple one was, uh, we did it over again, men and women alone taking the math test in a room, and just before they went into the room, we said, look, you may have heard that women don't do as well on difficult math tests as uh, men do. You might have heard that, but that's not true for the test you're taking today. The test you're taking today is a test on which women always do as well as men. And blah, blah, blah. So now, when they're in the taking the test and experiencing the frustration, the idea of its confirming the stereotype is off the table for this particular test. For this particular test, it's off the table. And when we did that, their performance went up to match that of equally skilled men. That 15-point gap went away. And that was the first evidence back then in the early 90s that gave us some sense that maybe this thing could be a factor that would affect outcomes in very insignificant ways. That was the, the, the idea. We replicated it and replicated it. And, and when we submitted this for publication, I think there were something like eight studies showing this effect. We then did it with race. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you one we didn't do, but, it's, but one that is um, just like the ones we did. It has a nicety, which I'll tell you about, that makes it easier to report. Uh, but uh, white and black college students given an IQ test, they're given the Raven Progressive Matrices IQ test. It's a nonverbal IQ test. Uh, 
Each item has a big square with a pattern on it. That's the, that's the, the item. And then there are five little squares with patterns on them. And you have to figure out which of the little squares has the same pattern as the big squares. And that's the whole test. And when you start the test, it's easy. You kind of rock and roll. But as you go along, it gets harder and harder and harder and more frustrating. And it's the frustration on a test that you think of as measuring your abilities that for an African-American student is going to evoke the stereotype in this society about African-American intellectual abilities. So it's going to make that relevant. Is, does it mean that, this, that, the, that the person is going to believe the stereotype? We'll get to that question in a minute. It's just going to evoke that stereotype. Uh, and a person is now going to have to be taking that test under the weight of whether they're proving that stereotype or disproving that stereotype. So doing that kind of an experiment, same thing. You get about a 15-point gap between African-American performance on that test and, and uh, white students on, on that test, which is exactly the difference uh, but in, IQ, in, in average IQ score between blacks and whites in the general population. So in the laboratory, again, these people had dem bottled what was out there in, in the real world, and they could look at it and see what, what's behind it. Well, in this experiment, and this is why I, I like talking about it, is because they had a very nifty way of getting the stereotype threat out of the situation. You do it again, same thing, but this time, you say, you, you don't let them have any idea that it is a test of cognitive abilities. You say, this is just a puzzle we're working on in the laboratory. It's a psychology experiment you're in. And, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out whether this puzzle is a good puzzle or not a good puzzle. So it's just a puzzle. Just go at it. You know, have fun at it. You know, just, you know, give your best, but enjoy it. Under that instruction, no difference between whites and blacks on, on the IQ test performance. No difference. Uh, uh, and, and under that instruction, there's no risk of any response or frustration confirming this stereotype about your group's intellectual abilities. You've taken that out of the situation by representing the test as not a measure of cognitive abilities. It's just, it's just a puzzle. And when you, when you do that, you eliminate this difference. So this... Uh, was giving us some considerable confidence that uh, stereotype threat uh, could have these kinds of effects. Um, since that time, there have been, you know, probably 500 published uh, studies showing stereotype threat effects of one sort uh, or, or another. Uh, because these effects are relatively easy to get, that's why they've been studied so much in so many different forms uh, throughout the world. Uh, one that is uh, particularly interesting and, and relevant to uh, this issue, I'll, I'll mention it now because it's relevant to the second half of the talk, but the kind of stereotype threat that whites can feel in interracial conversations about race in America. Profound form of stereotype threat. Uh, Stanford students, males, come into the laboratory one at a time and they learn they're going to be in a conversation with two other students. And they see pictures of the students. In one case, they're two black guys. In another case, they're two white guys. Then they learn that they're going to, uh, the topic of the conversation, it's either going to be about uh, love and relationships, which everybody's pretty comfortable talking to everybody about, uh, or it's going to be about racial profiling. So they are going to talk to either uh, two black guys or two white guys, either about love and relationships or racial profiling. The experimenter then says, well, look, I'm going to go down the hall and get your two conversation partners for the conversation and bring them back. And while, while I'm gone, do you mind just arranging the three chairs in the room for the conversation? And as you might guess, as soon as they arrange those chairs, that's the end of the experiment. That's what we're looking at, is how do they arrange these? How do they space themselves for this conversation? And you can probably predict the results, that when they think they're going to be uh, talking to uh, two white guys about anything or two black guys about love and relationships, they put the three chairs very close together. But when they're going to be talking to two black guys, two strangers, about racial profiling, they tend to put the two black guys over here and themselves over here. 
And we've also measured, before the experiment, their levels of prejudice. These are Stanford students. It's not extreme on the bad end, but, but there's variation. And the interesting thing is that it's the least prejudiced people who put those two black guys the farthest away when they think they're going to have to talk about uh, uh, racial profiling. Uh, it's the women who are the most invested in math who show the biggest stereotype threat effects. If they're not invested in math, then the whole thing is not personally relevant. It doesn't cause this kind of distress and, and so on. It's the African-American students who are the most invested in doing well academically that feel the pressure of possibly being stereotyped in terms of that stereotype. If you don't care about being good in math, you got your life predicated on another basis, then the prospect of being seen in terms of that stereotype isn't as isn't as menacing, isn't as threatening. It's, it's a bad problem for society, but it's not my problem. Uh, the white male athletes who show the biggest effects of stereotype threat are the ones that are the most committed to being an athlete. So the cr critical ingredient, what makes a person susceptible to stereotype threat in all these different uh, uh, manifestations of it is, is, is not the stereotype threat situation alone. It's, that it's affecting somebody who's in, who wants to do real well in the domain where their group is negatively stereotyped. I used to start this talk off for a while with the first few minutes of uh, Eminem's movie, Eight Mile. <laughs> uh, here's a white guy that wants to be a great rapper. Uh, and this is a kind of biopic of him. And it starts off with a tremendous psychic pressure he was under. Uh, and I, I can't think, it's, it's, the scene is so amazing. Here, here he is, he's throwing up in the bathroom, the, the, the only white guy in the whole club. Uh, and you have to go in a rapping uh, contest. You're, you're up against another rapper. There's two rappers in there. And, and the, the one rapper gets to insult the hell out of the other rapper, and then the other rapper has to respond to that. And you, you got to be on your toes and be on your, well, uh, uh, Eminem is certainly up to that, but on this evening, early in his career, it's a very frustrating task. And, and there's a crowd out there pulsing with a, approval or disapproval of what you're saying. <laughs> so it's, it's an, and and the, the stereotype that he's under and that the crowd is chanting is, you're white with a mic. You, you can't rap. You're white with a mic. Go home. So uh, he gets there. The, the first rapper annihilates him. Uh, now it's his chance to come back. He's given the mic. He can't say anything. He has to just kind of hand the mic to the DJ and walk off the stage. So I think it's a particularly powerful version <laughs> uh, for one episode of, of what stereotype threat looks like. But it makes the, the point, if, if, if Eminem didn't care about rapping, if he hadn't made the mistake to align his life with a domain of performance where his group is negatively stereotyped, he wouldn't have that kind of pressure. And that really gives you some sense of how the stereotype pre it works, how it, how it affects our, our decision making and the like. Uh, just a real short note about how, it's, how the effect is mediated, how it's experienced on the, on the ground. Uh, it, 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 it makes one vigilant all the time as to what's going on. Is the stereotype in play or not in play? You don't know. And that's part of the stress of the situation. It's a situation that's important to you, but you really don't know whether that person was stereotyping you or not. Uh, and so you are kind of on constant vigilance. It's the cues in the situation. You're talking to other people in the situation who have the same identity you do, and you're kind of parsing through. Well, what happens? Why, did, why didn't he return my email? What, what's with not returning my telephone calls? Uh, is that about what? Uh, hmm. Uh, and it's a very daunting thing to uh, entertain the idea that what hap it's what's happening to you could possibly be coming from such a thing as a negative stereotype about your, your whole group. So you're, you're fighting it. You're resisting it. Uh, as I say, I've been using the, the analogy, it's like living with a, with a snake in the house. You know, this, this happened to me once. 
uh, <laughs> uh, I, you know, for weeks, you're kind of, everything you see could be that snake, and you're talking to you, what was that, <laughs> how big was the snake when you saw it come in? This is my son was the, the witness to the snake coming in the house. Uh, he said, well, it's pretty big, Dad, you know, <laughs> no comfort there. Uh, well, we, we don't have poisonous snakes here in this, in this neighborhood. Well, I don't know, they say that, so... Uh, Anyway, it's, it's kind of like that. It's kind of puts you on, on vigilance in the, in the situation. And you might not have any sense of this st starting to happen to you until you're actually in the situation. It's a land that you don't know much about until you get to it. And then you feel it. And you don't know quite what to do about it. Now, what makes you feel it? And this is going to be the transition into... Uh, how to design uh, a, a, a successful, diverse community. Uh, you, you, you feel it based on the cues in the situation. I'm a psychologist. This was the last thing I suspected as the source of it. Uh, we psychologists, the standard view throughout the 20th century of how stereotypes affect their target groups, uh, women, Blacks, Latinos, Jews, uh, Freud, actually, W.E. Du Bois vented, invented the idea that the stereotype is eventually internalized. You hear about it, and it's internalized, and the person tends to believe it, and then when they're in, or accept it at some level, and then when they're in a situation where the stereotype is relevant, it gets triggered, and they self-fulfill the stereotype. That's been the standard view of, of uh, what, what goes on out there. And this is a very different view of how the stereotype works. You don't have to believe in the stereotype. You don't have to have any conviction about it. It's just that you are in a situation where you know you could be seen and treated that way. You, it's, it's your read of the social situation you're in. It's a situational pressure. It's not an internalized belief that you take from one situation to the next, like we might take our neuroticism from one situation to the next, or our low self-esteem from one situation to the next. It's not like that. It's simply a situational pressure. In this situation, because of the numbers of other people here, or uh, something somebody said, I realize I could be seen in terms of that stereotype. That's a possibility now. It's a situational pr uh, pressure. So uh, then I started to think and sort of play amateur psychologist, well, excuse me, amateur, amateur sociologist. Uh, well, what would be the cues that would, would make me worry about that in a situation? Uh, and uh, we've researched a, a lot of them. Certainly critical mass is a, is a cue. If I feel like, uh, I think everybody has been in a situation where they've not, where they've been one of the, on, of, one of the only only one person who has a particular identity in a situation, the only black among whites, the only man among women, women among men, so on and so forth, being, being a small minority uh, can make one feel, as a cue that can make one feel like one is subject to stereotypes about that minority. So that's a, an example of a cue. I talk about that. I won't take the time to unravel it here, but I had a great deal of, of fun looking at women on the Supreme Court and the history of, of that and how their feelings of discomfort ebbed and flowed as a function of how many other women are on the Supreme Court. When you're the only one, when, you, when uh, Sandra Day O'Connor was the only woman on the Supreme Court, she described the experience as asphyxiating. She just was completely, you know, sh followed everywhere, uh, uh, blanketed by uh, uh, being seen as, what is a woman like? Is she smart enough, wise enough? Is she a feminist? Is she not feminist? All these questions uh, 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 were attached to her. When Ginsburg got there, that lightened up considerably. Then when O'Connor left and Ginsburg was left alone, oh, Ginsburg started to feel it. So it's a, just a nice story of how a situational variable can, uh, like that, that seems maybe, ooh, what's the, wh wh why should that make a difference? Well, it, it just, it, it affects this assessment, this vigilant assessment as to the likelihood that I could be seen in terms of a negative view of my group. That's how it comes to uh, have a, a personal a significance in a situation and have consequences for how one functions uh, in, in a situation. Uh, playing um, amateur 
sociologists, you, you, the, the story gets dark for a minute. So uh, it's going to get better, but it's going to get dark for a minute. <laughs> uh, we have in this society uh, a, a very complicated history with regard to identity. Since the beginning, since the, the new world met the old world, identity has been used to in, engineer advantage in various ways, early on in horrific ways, involved, and from indentured servitude to slavery to genocide to reservations to segregation laws. As a society, we should be proud of the fact that we resisted this. There's been that element in society, too. We had a civil war. We had a civil rights movement. And we struggle with this to this day. In part, this is what we're doing now. Uh, but we have to acknowledge that uh, uh, the degree to which our society has, has organized itself and its allocation of advantage around identities is profound and rema remains profound. I was just at the, in Memphis at the commemoration of MLK's assassination, and uh, I was sat through a day of four panels of civil rights lawyers talking about one aspect of American life after the next aspect of American life that is, uh, there's no better word for it than rigged, just rigged. Uh, housing, just think about the housing and, and uh, the, the, the covenants and the, the redlining and the predatory uh, lending. Then think about schools and the, the nature of school, of, of, of school financing, the allocation of monies from one community to the, to the next community. Then think about health care and access to it. Then think about food. And I could go on and on. You know, the list is, is, quite, a, is quite substantial. So uh, the first thing to say is that the, the way in which we have used identity to organize our society uh, is itself a cue that can make one feel uh, vulnerable to being stereotyped and seen negatively through the lens of stereotypes about that identity. That alone can, can do it. I, I think we, we would like to, I certainly would like to, I think everybody would like to imagine that uh, uh, you can come into a new setting like a university or a school and kind of leave, we can all leave that at the door. Just forget about it. Why, why, do, why do our identities have to follow us everywhere? But we have a history that makes that extremely difficult to do because as soon as the first thing goes wrong, uh, if, you're, if you have such an identity, it raises the possibility that that is just another instance of this long litany, this long history of, uh, of American society and how it has treated and seen my people. So it's difficult for a rational person func functioning in some attunement with reality to dismiss that out of hand. That's almost what, doing that would almost be false consciousness. So I, I think one more mature step we need to make as a society is to understand that this threat is there as a function of our, uh, of our history. And, you know, this past summer, and I'm sure as, as going on, I was just appointed to a renaming committee at, at uh, Stanford that the whole I issue of how we represent our history is another factor that is a cue that tells us the extent to which uh, a set of stereotypes is in play in, a, in a, uh, a society. The composition of the setting. Is there critical mass? Is there diversity in the leadership? Uh, all of these things are cues that can send something, a message to this inquiring mind as to how likely they are of being threatened in a situation. I think uh, we have certain ideologies, uh, especially uh, as a psychologist, uh, I think about the ideologies we have around ability as being, especially intellectual ability, especially rarefied intellectual abilities, as being genetically based. Uh, and if you're the group <laughs> who's entering into a domain where people think that that is the kind of ability you need to succeed in the domain, and there are not a lot of, of, of fellow citizens like you in the domain, that's a very threatening situation. Uh, I remember that from my own time in graduate school, being the only African-American in the, in the social sciences, everybody talking about who was smart and who was really, really smart and really, really, really good at it. And like, uh, none of them uh, came from my group. So you have to, and, and that, that just puts you, a, you sort of exhibit A of the group that isn't among that uh, 
rarefied group. So that, that's another situation, just the, just the, the our, our language around ability uh, uh, can be uh, a cue that makes a person feel they're, they're at some risk of this. Okay, um, I want to stop being dark. I just want to paint the picture that all of this could be true if you didn't have one single prejudiced person in the environment. Just the organization itself of, of our society uh, could, could uh, make us feel this way. Even if everybody in this situation was pulling to the contrary. I'm going to make the case, perhaps stronger than I believe it, that worrying a lot about who's, who's racist, who's prejudiced, is, is, is like a distraction. The real uh, 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 challenge is to sort of unwire this advantage engineering that has been predicated on identity. Go to the worry about school financing. Worry about the prison to school pipeline. What's causing that? Worry about the use of standardized testing. When is it good and when is it really destructive to whole segments of, of, of a society? If we start to take those questions on, I would be a lot more uh, happy than if we worry uh, an awful lot about um, whether each individual of us is prejudiced or not. Now, this is not to, for a minute to diminish the importance of that. It's depressing when you look at that literature. I could still hand out an essay. I could put a black name on it or a white name on it. It would get a very different grade. The same essay is a function of whose name's on it. So, and that you can see, you can play that out. That's going to have some su really significant consequences. So I don't want to diminish that. But, but our problem is deeper than, than that. And I think it's, it's what we need to, it's the default uh, in a situation that we will have a lack of trust in diverse settings. A lack of trust is, I think, the default reality. Vigilant trust at the very best. I'm going to give it a shot, but uh, I'm paying attention. Uh, the capacity to trust in uh, coming together, to trust each other, coming together in diverse settings after this history, and as this history uh, has many legacies that, that continue, that I think uh, gets to what our, uh, our basic uh, challenge is. Uh, so I want to argue that uh, here I am making a proposal. I have, uh, uh, the, it's, in the science contest, is a hypothesis that it is most important for diverse settings in order to function well uh, to work on building trust. Building trust rather than necessarily uh, defeating a bias. Unfortunately, a lot of efforts to defeat bias uh, can actually worsen trust and polarize people, distance people from, from each other. That can happen. <laughs> Maybe it regularly happens even. Uh, but the, the, so, so I, again, I don't want to say that's not something we should do. We should do that with all our might because that's important, and I think we've learned a great deal from having uh, tried to do that, some of which will help build trust. But I think that the primary uh, uh, goal of uh, uh, the effort to build successful, diverse communities should be focused on building trust. Uh, there are a couple of things that, just personal things that... Uh, uh, come to mind in support of this. This is the exact opposite of using data to support an argument. These are just things that I, I remember. Uh, at that uh, Memphis uh, symposium I saw, I, I vaguely heard of it before, but there was a very compelling quote. I wish I had the quote to read to you, but it was from Martin Luther King, and it was toward the end of his life. And he was in an interview asked about what his anxieties were, and he said, well, one of my big anxieties is um, uh, school integration because I'm worried I'm worried that our children will not be taught by people who love them. And um, right after that, I was interestingly at a bat mitzvah. And uh, the young lady going through it, taking the Torah through the audience, and the rabbi is at the front uh, saying, the Torah contains the wisdom of our people. And this is a transmission of that wisdom to the young, to this young person, this young lady in this, uh, in this instance. And he's talking about how, what a great, tra what a tradition this is, how ancient it is. Uh, and he's saying that this transition of knowledge and wisdom cannot happen without love. 
And, I, you know, they'll stop. I'm a psychologist. I'm hard-nosed. I don't want to give you any, I want to have any music in the background here. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's hard to, it's hard to argue with, with those, those basic uh, insights and, not see, and see them as not relevant to the kind of thing we're all uh, thinking about here. How do you have a successfully diverse uh, community? That's what the vigilance, that's what the trust um, is, is about uh, to some degree, is, is achieving that. Okay, uh, so how do you do that? Well, so now I'm going to get much more mundane and try to uh, list a few, uh, if, if, may, certainly principles and maybe a little bit more specific than, than uh, principles, uh, aimed at building trust in uh, 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 communities. Uh, and I, I like to think of it as, a, as having uh, an opening up of uh, uh, the opportunity to be involved in the effort. Uh, everybody can participate in building trust. Uh, and so I think it has a more inclusive, uh, you know, character to it uh, than other strategies that may be used in building uh, successfully diverse uh, communities. Uh, but the first uh, item on the list uh, is that we have to get more comfortable about talking about identity. Identity for all of the reasons that I just talked about, that I just mentioned, for all of those reasons, uh, is, is pretty loaded for us Americans to talk about. We, we don't like it. We just think, damn it, you know, this is democracy. Uh, people are people, basically. Uh, and uh, why don't they just leave their identities at the door? Why all this royal, constant roiling up about this, th this issue? And what's it relevant to what I'm teaching or what I'm doing? Uh, what's the relevance uh, of that? And so un under that uh, kind of defensive, I'm going to just call it that, defensive, although I've indulged in it myself, so I want to, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, the, uh, what, what's the, the, the problem with that? Why, why isn't that, that working, and how, and how do you, you get around it? Well, uh, you know, it, it has a language to it. For example, colorblindness would be a, a good term. I, you know, I'm colorblind. I don't see difference. I, I just don't relate to it. Well, when, when somebody who's had, who is of a group, who's had the histories I've just described, hears somebody say they're colorblind, they, I mean, they laugh on the inside. How could that possibly be true? That, 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 there's still too much disadvantaged organized around uh, these identities to talk about colorblindness. That's, a privil that's a something said from a privileged uh, uh, perspective. Well, uh, how, do you, how do we get comfortable talking about identities then? Uh, I'll go back to that experiment where the Stanford uh, white guys are talking to the two black guys about racial profiling there was a, a, a procedure we could use which enabled them to move their chairs closer together in that experiment. Uh, and that was, just before they uh, sat down for the, the conversation, we said, look, you know, nobody really knows how to ha handle these conversations. These are difficult conversations in America. They're tied to all kinds of feelings, and if you don't know each other and you don't haven't built up a relationship with each other, uh, there's a lot of risk in having these kind of conversations. So uh, uh, you should just know that. Everybody should, should know that. And the appropriate approach to it should be to just treat it as a learning opportunity. Treat the conversation as a learning opportunity. Not a situation where you have to perform not being a racist. Just treat it as a, as a learning opportunity. And when you're in doubt, ask questions. Inquire about things. Don't be an obnoxious pest uh, and invade privacy and so on. But, but ask questions. That'll allow people to talk to you and then listen to them. So with that instruction, they all move their chairs very close together. Just un no difference from the other uh, situations. They, they wanted an opportunity to have that kind of a conversation. In, in these situations. It, it had been repressed, the desire, it had been re re repressed by the, the, the fear of that participation could get them judged as racist. But uh, with, this, with this strategy of, of just taking, themse taking themselves as learners and an opportunity to hear the perspective of another uh, person, they could begin to feel 
uh, comfortable with that and feel safe in those conversations. So I think that's a, that's a very useful, generalizable uh, strategy. I've been uh, looking at, at un unlikely relationships uh, everywhere I can find them, uh, from Miles Davis and Gil Evans to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and John Wooden, his coach. These are interracial relationships, friendships that were deep, really as close as to each other as they were to anybody else on earth. Uh, and they were between people who have very different identities and backgrounds and who would have very little uh, upfront reason to trust each other. But they did trust each other. They got to trust each other. Uh, and they, they, they were open to each other. They, they shared, in both of those examples, they shared tremendous interests. Uh, and so they really wanted to know what the other person thought about all kinds of things. And as soon as you send the cue, that you are interested in what the other person thinks, they begin to trust you. It works that way. There's nothing like having somebody be interested. Uh, I used my own advisor uh, in graduate school in the circumstance I was just describing as an example. Uh, um, I, I kind of relaxed in graduate school when I realized he was actually interested in what I thought about things. And, you know, he'd stick his head in, his, in, my, in my office and ask me questions. And uh, I, really, and I, I would start getting ready to answer those questions. Uh, and and the, whole, the whole relationship took on a different, uh, a different feel to it. He didn't proclaim that he had exactly the right attitudes that, that I would have preferred another human being to have. I don't know what his attitudes were on a lot of things. But I, I knew he was open to, to me. And I, I, I think right in front of us is a set of strategies and skills that uh, we can interpersonally use to get over these, these, uh, uh, these boundaries that are uh, held back by uh, these reciprocating forms of stereotype threat. I, I was just using this morning the example of the, st the to, just to illustrate how powerful these pressures can be. The, the, the conversation, the, the standard parent-child, uh, teacher Parent-teacher conversation, parent you got to get those words right, parent-teacher uh, conversation in school between a white teacher and a black family. Think about that situation. Uh, and think about how history is going to affect and shape that situation and the, the capacity to trust there. The black family is going to come in and they might well be thinking, can this woman really see the talent in my son? Uh, can she really appreciate that? Or is she going to take every... Uh, violation or every little childish thing he does and see that as aggression because that's what the evidence suggests happens. Uh, and I've really got to be, this is my moment to be vigilant here about that. And the teacher, on the other hand, has the problem of uh, I can't say anything constructive to this family about the development of this child without them thinking I'm a racist. Now that's American history visiting us right there in the middle of a conversation. If we were in a different society with a different history, those two people could have a kind of, you know, standard conversation. It wouldn't mean very much. But in this situation, it means a lot. And this, is a, this is a, that's what I mean by it's being a default uh, a feature of, of, of American life that if we're going to have an efficient, uh, successful, diverse community, we have to kind of start there. And that's why I think this trust building uh, argument, that's, where I get, that's how I get to this notion of, of trust building. Okay, the first one was uh, try these strategies. Uh, the teacher should perhaps ask questions. The parents should perhaps ask questions. They should really give each other a chance to be heard in that conversation and not immediately organize their behavior on the basis of the stereotype they're afraid of being seen in terms of. That's the trick, is to simply relax that and become an explorer, and, and a, a tactful one at that, an explorer in, in this situation. And that will begin to build a trust that will enable the kind of exchange of information they want to have happen. Uh, the, another one is, uh, another, is, number two would be, uh, be careful about the narratives that we give our students and our family members. Uh, here's a study done at Yale. I was talking about it earlier this morning, so it's on the top of my mind. Um, white and black uh, freshmen at Yale get a videotape of another kid 18 months ahead of them at Yale, a black kid 
And in the videotape, the black kid says, you know, when I first came to Yale, I really hated it. Uh, I, I just felt so alienated. This is such a Euro-focused world. Uh, how could I ever belong here, be accepted here? Uh, I, I, I just, I went home on the weekends. It was just too much pressure. Finally, my father makes me come back to campus and, and, and stay, stay here, get out of the house and stay here. And my roommate and I, we form a, a singing group and we get invited to a few department colloquia. And I went to a few of those colloquia and I went to one in sociology that I thought was just fascinating. And then I went to one in biology and I just loved it. And I've now taken three biology courses here at Yale and I can't believe how interesting biology is. I, I think it could be my, uh, my life course. I really, I, I love this and I can't believe how much Yale uh, has to offer. Uh, so that's it. That's the narrative. Starts with a kind of acknowledgement of the pressure and the stress that a person might be under, but then it ends on a very hopeful note. Uh, reminds me an awful lot of an Obama narrative about things. Realistic, but ends with some sense of hope and vision. Uh, well, when for, for, for black kids who got that, who just randomly assigned uh, one to that condition, some didn't get it and some got it. Those who were randomly assigned to get it, their grades go up a third of a letter grade, and four years later, there's no underperformance. And a series of papers in science show this, give you the details on this, but... How could that have happened? Well, uh, the theory, the idea, the explanation is that uh, that first uh, uh, videotape for the kids that saw it, it, it kind of gives them a different narrative about the situation they're in, about the nature of being at Yale, a different understanding of it. It's not that uh, it's one that it doesn't deny their, their anxieties and pressures. Uh, it doesn't deny that there's prejudice in the United States. But it says, despite that, you're going to be able to find some amazing things in this institution. And so it gives them a very different feeling about the institution. Uh, and then, relaxing a little bit, they can pay a little more attention to work. Work gets a little better. They succeed a little better. Getting, getting a little bit more success generates an even lighter interpretation of the environment. And you get this recursive process that uh, ultimately under, uh, gets away from that underperformance. The, the underperformance in the control group happens, and it happens in a recursive way too, but it's a negative process. Uh, I come to Yale, I'm feeling these anxieties, I'm distracted, I don't do so well, I don't know quite what to do, I get even more worried about the kind of threat and menace I'm under here. Uh, that begins to take up more of my psychic energies, I, don't, I do even worse when it, you get an underperformance uh, kind of phenomenon. So I, I think in part that's, we're unraveling what diversity in a society like ours uh, uh, means and, and what it can do. And I think this is, a, this is a piece of evidence that suggests the importance of narrative. I think certainly minority parents know this problem of narrative very well. How do I prepare my child to deal with the world? Do I tell them there's no prejudice in the world? It's all over, it's in the past? And then he turns on the TV and sees a bunch of police shootings? Or do I tell them, no, man, they are really out there after us, and you've got to watch everything all day, every day. It's all to how, can it, how can a person live with that kind of narrative? So we have to get artful about the narratives, the understandings that, that we have, the humanity that we, that, that we have. Uh, another one, we don't, uh, uh, three, I think we need occasions in which we can get to know each other personally. And this is very hard because we do come from a history of segregation. And all we have to do is look at our social networks and see that. Uh, and that the people whom we get to talk to personally about, about things are often uh, in the same identity category as we are. Uh, and so we, we disrupted this at the University of, of Michigan by setting up uh, late night conversations in dorms that were focused on personal things. How do you get along with your parents? What about your boyfriend or girlfriend back home? What about your family financing? What do you think is a good major and so on? Just a bunch of personal things and they every week uh, induced by pizza and donuts. Late at night, they get to talk <laughs> about this and it's, and, it's, and it's an integrated group. Well, it had miraculous effects on the academic performance of the African-American students. Bigger effects. We also had them in six-hour-a-week academic support workshops. 
that we're going to give them advanced, accelerated work in chemistry, physics, writing, and so on. It, those had a, a modest effect, but this had a huge effect. And again, eliminated underperformance. And it, it, it makes me aware of how uh, segregation of the, is our legacy uh, can affect the information basis I have for interpreting the situation I'm in. Uh, if I'm just talking to black kids, which I did during my freshman year in college, uh, I think then everything negative happens probably is happening to me because of race. I'm not hearing any other. I don't have, another, I don't have any other information to counter that. But if I, talk to, if I get a chance to talk to white kids and I find out, well, that, you mean the TA did not return your email too? And you got a C minus too when you thought you were going to get a B plus? And it, it, it kind of waters down the degree to which my identity and the history of the country and everything is relevant to interpreting the immediate situation I'm in. And because we have a social segregation of the sort that we have, it's very difficult for any of us to get those kinds of experiences. So I think as, as educators in this society dealing with uh, the need to have more successfully diverse uh, communities, um, we need to do a better job of structuring those kinds of, of, uh, of, uh, of interactions. Uh, I, it, you, I, I think we're, we're sitting on top of a demographic necessity here, which I, uh, is probably worth, worth noting. Uh, by 2000, what is it, 2040, uh, there will be as many uh, minorities in the country as there will be whites. By 2050, there will be more minorities in the country. In, in San Francisco, where I live, there are more minorities. It's a minority-majority city. Uh, it's a different world, different politics, different issues. Di everything is kind of different in that kind of a, uh, of a context. So I think that is behind the uh, uh, supplying some of the urgency for this kind of uh, uh, attention to this, to this issue. Uh, two last things. One is, of course, has been stressed a great deal, but the physical environment. Uh, a woman should not, and this is in the Stanford uh, math department, uh, go down to before you get to the receptionist, you have to go uh, down a wall which has 12 pictures of great mathematicians on them, all men, white men. Um, by the time you get to the receptionist's desk, it's like, I don't belong here. That, that, that's a signal, that's a, that's a feature. We can do something about that kind of thing. That isn't that costly to do, uh, uh, to, to do that. Uh, and we need to be, design our environment so that they're more welcoming and supportive and reduce the tendency for me to be vigilant and think I've got a snake in the house. We should pay attention to the physical environments in that regard. Last of all, um, and I, I have a great deal of faith in this, one of the things my advisor did for me that um, uh, was critical to both my, d d the deepening trust in our relationship and, and I think my motivation to stay in uh, the field, which had wavered considerably by that time, uh, was that he just showed me what to do. He showed me what to do to be a scientist. He said, look, he kept on saying this, you know, here, here it is. You get a problem that you think is important. Uh, you read everything in the world you can read about it. You think of some hypotheses that might move our understanding forward. You think of some research you can do to test those hypotheses. You test it over and over again to make sure you've got what you think you've got. You use the most sophisticated statistics and other inferential strategies you can, you can muster to understand this thing. You write it up with, we, with meaning. You'll submit it to, an art, uh, to a journal. It'll get rejected. You, res you revise it, and it'll get accepted. And then you're a scientist. And it was like, wow, that's, that's it? <laughs> that, that's what this is about? Uh, <laughs> so, I, you know, I, that, I kept that in my mind. Well, this is what the whole thing is about. Um, I think when you see another problem I'm very interested in is uh, our, our, how our K through 12 schools uh, function, which now have to educate 53% um, uh, the majority of the kids in our K through 12 schools are poor. Is our pedagogy meeting that need? Can it really help those kids, or is it is it is it a situation that's just worsening the situation? That's the, uh, a basic uh, uh, question. 
in, in that situation. But a lot of those kids don't, have, don't come from families that have the cultural capital, the know-hows to, to know exactly what, what, what teachers need in that situation. They, they, don't, they, need to be, they need to have it explained to them. This is, this is what uh, we're doing here. This is what I want you to learn. This, here are the markers as to how you're doing. You can judge for yourself how well you're doing. Uh, I think you can do it. This is going to be demanding, but I think you can do it. That kind of, uh, 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 of an attitude that just lays out the particulars of how a person should, should go. Uh, uh, I, I think is incredibly important. We did a survey at uh, Berkeley of the physical sciences and how women and, and minorities uh, were doing compared to whites and Asian males. Uh, how were they doing on uh, the early indicators of publication? That being, of course, the, co the, the coin of the realm in graduate programs. How are you presenting at conferences? Have you uh, taken the right uh, uh, methodologi methodology courses and so on and so forth? And sure enough, in most of those uh, departments, as you'd expect, women and minorities were not doing as well. There was underperformance compared to white and Asian males except in chemistry. And when you look closely at what chemistry was doing, it was, it's a college at Berkeley. It's not just a department. Uh, it, was, it was choreographing every moment of the, of the graduate student's time when they, when they got there. We want you in three weeks to have a problem uh, that you are going to do your first year project on, and you, will, you have appointments with this faculty, this faculty, and this faculty, at least three faculty, and they will be held accountable to talking to you, and you'll find out what they do, because on Sunday afternoon there's going to be a presentation of all their research, and then, then you're going to... Everything was structured. We want you to publish and to be... Uh, a contributor, and this is how you do it. Here are the, sk the skills that you, that you need to do it, and here are the markers that you can use to evaluate how you're doing in a situation. So with, with all of that structure there, I'm not left in an ambig amb ambiguous situation. How am I doing, and am I really smart enough? And those things are kind of answered by a pretty clear step forward in, in, in a very clear, very detailed uh, set of steps forward, at least for the first two or three years of graduate school, which, which seemed to have this, uh, uh, this powerful effect of creating no difference in the number of conference presentations and, and submitted drafts and all of the things that go into uh, publication rates between, between uh, women and minorities and white and Asian males. So uh, the, 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 I've come to have a certain amount of, uh, of hope about that uh, strategy, uh, that a lot of the, us, when we're in situations that are, are important to us, uh, a bit stressful, uh, part of the stress is figuring out what to do how do I cope with this? What is efficient, effective way to perform in a situation? And having a clear view of that. If you come from a family, for example, of, of academics, you, for example, and if we're talking about academia, if you come from a family, then they may be able to really tell you, and you would kind of have that all, all worked out. You'd have that cultural uh, bag, that, that cultural knowledge to know what's going on. But if you don't, and you come from a background, uh, first uh, gens or something of that sort, uh, minority uh, students, you're in a new field, you don't know how you're doing. And it's all about how smart you are. And that makes all of the stereotypes about your group's abilities relevant. And it can, can, be, can have at you that way. And having this other orientation uh, kind of stops that, blunts that as a, as a process. Okay, um, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> I've probably worn you out, but uh, I appreciate your coming and I appreciate your, uh, your listening. Thank you.